From the Ear to There Travel Studio, this is the Ear to There Disney Podcast. The Ear to There Podcast, it's time to start the show. Be sure to hold on tight, here we go. Exploring all the different Disney destinations. Ear to There, it's time to start the fun. Hello everybody and welcome to the Ear to There Podcast. Walt Disney World Word of the Week. I am your host, Phil Gramlich, and each and every week I will find and bring you a new Walt Disney World Word and then give you all kinds of tips, tricks, hints, history, background, all kinds of stuff about that word. All right, so this week's Word of the Week is brought to you by the letter F. F for Frontierland. And I don't know how I skipped Frontierland the first two times I did the letter F, but here we go. This week will be all about the history and hopefully some things about Frontierland that you may have never even heard before. So let's take a trip back to before Frontierland was even a land when it was just one of the five concepts for lands in Disneyland by Walt Disney himself. In the early 1950s, Westerns were all the rage, right? Westerns were like the Game of Thrones of today. I mean, there were TV shows, there were movies. Every kid wanted to play Cowboys and Indians. Every adult wanted to be as cool as John Wayne, right? And Walt Disney was a really smart guy, and he thought, well, I better get one of these types of areas in my new theme park. So when Disneyland opened on July 17th, 1955, Frontierland was, of course, one of the original lands of Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom. He dedicated each and every land that day with a little speech, and I could read it to you, but I think hearing it from Walt himself would be better. So introducing Walt Disney and his Disneyland Frontierland dedication speech. Before you enter this realm, I'd like to read this dedication, which will be inscribed on a plaque. Frontierland. It is here that we experience the story of our country's past. The color, romance, and drama of frontier America as it developed from wilderness trails to roads, riverboats, railroads, and civilization. A tribute to the faith, courage, and ingenuity of our hardy pioneers who blazed the trails and made this progress possible. Thank you, Walt. (laughs) Now, Walt's original Frontierland didn't contain many attractions, right? Instead, it focused more on open expanses of wilderness, which could be traversed by guests via stagecoach, pack mules, Conestoga wagons, and walking trails. Now, one interesting thing that I kind of discovered as I was doing my research for this week's show was that apparently Frontierland was inspired by a New York Wild West Park called Frontier Town. Frontier Town opened in the Adirondack Mountains on July 4th, 1952, and remained open until 1999. That is, except for a couple years in the 1980s when it was closed. Anyway, Walt apparently heard about this park, and again, this is not according to the Disney, official Disney account of Frontierland. But apparently Walt heard about Frontier Town, sent a camera crew up under the guise of filming a movie there, got footage of the park, and used that footage to inspire his Frontierland in Disneyland. So that very well may have happened. Uh, That is the story, according to a book, about the history of the park Frontier Town called Frontier Town Then and Now. Now, the other side of that, I guess, argument is that a lot of Walt Disney's early Imagineers came from the movies and had a lot of experience on the big lots out in Los Angeles. So the early art directors for Disneyland, like Dick Irvine, Sam McKim, and Bill Martin, these guys worked on the 20th Century Fox lot out in Los Angeles. Other Imagineers also came from the MGM lot out in Los Angeles, so a lot of these guys were used to working on these huge movie sets and these huge lots. 
And they also understood that Walt's background was in movie making and filmmaking. And he had envisioned Disneyland to be a permanent movie set. So that is what most of Disneyland is. That is especially what Frontierland is, is that permanent movie set, including, you know, the Golden Horseshoe and the Mark Twain Riverboat and the Rivers of America. All of those things were inspired, apparently, by things that the early Imagineers had worked with on the different movie lots out in Los Angeles. So anyway, back in 1955, when Frontierland first opened, the land was kind of broken down into three different areas. There was the Frontier Fort, which had the Golden Horseshoe Saloon. There was the Riverfront, which had the Mark Twain Riverboat and the old Indian Village. And then there was the Painted Desert section that had the stagecoaches and the pack mules and some of those walking trails that I talked about earlier. So in the late 1950s, it was decided that Frontierland would get an enlargement and a makeover. So there were four new areas that Walt Disney wanted to add to his Frontierland in the late 1950s. They were the new mine train attraction that would join the pack mules and stagecoaches over in the Painted Desert section of Frontierland. There would be an island added to the middle of the Rivers of America, of course, that would become Tom Sawyer Island, the Native American or Indian village that was originally located next to the Mark Twain uh, landing there would be moved across to the other side of the river where Splash Mountain is now standing. And the area that's next to Fowler's Harbor, of course, where they dock the Mark Twain, actually the spot that now houses the Haunted Mansion, would have been developed into a new themed area called Rivertown. Of course, by 1956, all of these elements were added to the park, except for one, and that, unfortunately, well, or maybe fortunately, if you're a big Haunted Mansion fan, was Rivertown. And apparently, Walt wanted Rivertown even before that 1956 expansion, because in his Frontierland dedication speech, he said, we will ride a covered wagon to a roaring Rivertown pay a visit to Slewfoot Sue's Golden Horseshoe, and then catch the paddle wheel steamer Mark Twain, <laughs> that's hard to say, for a trip down the rivers of America. So why did everything else get built and Rivertown was left out? Well, no one really knows for sure, but in the research that I, <laughs> I did for this week, in the hours and hours of research, it seems that while everything else was being started and being built, there was another idea on the table for that little section of land or big section of land that eventually became the Haunted Mansion. And that was a New Orleans style town. So while everything else got greenlit and got built, that river town was never built. Instead, back in that area where Haunted Mansion is, we got New Orleans Square, the Haunted Mansion and Pirates of the Caribbean. So like I said, in 1956, all that construction started by 1960, the mine train through Nature's Wonderland had opened, and that attraction stayed opened until 1977 when it was closed to accommodate the roller coaster Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. What's really cool, though, about Disneyland's version of Frontierland is there are still remnants of that old mine train attraction in Frontierland, even with the new Star Wars Galaxy's Edge construction going on over there. There are a couple of tunnels and some old abandoned train tracks if you know where to look, that were once part of that mine train through nature's wonderland. And they still stand, like I said, today. Also, the town of Rainbow Ridge that was originally in the mine train through nature's wonderland attraction is now a part of the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad attraction. And yet that's the same old Rainbow Ridge that was there that opened back in 1960. Currently in Disneyland, there are other attractions in Frontierland joining Big Thunder Mountain, and they are the Frontierland Shooting Arcade, of course, the Mark Twain Riverboat that has been there since opening day, Pirate's Lair on Tom Sawyer Island. That's a bit of a converted Tom Sawyer Island than you, that used to be in Disneyland. And remember, Tom Sawyer Island in Disneyland was the one attraction that Walt Disney himself actually sketched out in his barn on Carrollwood Drive in Los Angeles. And it was built pretty much exactly to the specifications that he had laid out that night. And of course, uh, the sailing ship Columbia is the last attraction that is currently operating in Frontierland 
in Disneyland. Of course, there are other versions of Frontierland in all the different Magic Kingdom parks around the world. Disneyland, of course, opened July 17th, 1955. The Frontierland at the Magic Kingdom opened, or excuse me, Magic Kingdom opened October 1st of 1971. Tokyo Disneyland's Frontierland opened on April 15th, 1983. Disneyland Paris's Frontierland opened on April 12th, 1992. And Grizzly Gulch, which is Hong Kong Disneyland's version of Frontierland, opened in 2012. Now, since this is the Walt Disney World word of the week, I wanted to quickly run down the attractions that are in Magic Kingdom's Frontierland that you may be more familiar with. And they are, of course, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. The Country Bear Jamboree is still going as strong as ever in Frontierland at the Magic Kingdom. Splash Mountain, the Frontierland Shooting Arcade, Frontierland Hoedown Happening, Tom Sawyer Island, and, of course, the Walt Disney World Railroad still has its Frontierland station in Frontierland, of course, obviously. <laughs> of course, Frontierland in Magic Kingdom and out in Disneyland are very similar, but yet really, really different at the same time. Of course, Disneyland's Frontierland has prime viewing locations for Fantasmic, which operates on the Rivers of America, which is a big, big difference from Walt Disney World's Fantasmic that operates at Hollywood Studios in its own amphitheater. Another big difference between the two Frontierlands in Disneyland and Walt Disney World is Disneyland's Frontierland has an entrance or a gateway off the central hub. That gateway is constructed of ponderosa pine logs, and it's a pretty tall, pretty cool looking structure if you've never been out there. Also, when you walk in, there's a huge flagpole with the dedication plaque at the bottom of it. Of course, this dedication plaque is the one that Walt Disney read on opening day of Disneyland. In the Magic Kingdom, Frontierland is the only land that does not have access from the central hub. So that's a great trivia question if you're going to ask someone. And I think I have asked that one on one of my trivia nights on Facebook Live. What is the one land in Magic Kingdom that doesn't have a gateway from the hub? And of course, it is Frontierland. And that is going to do it for this week's episode of the Ear to Their podcast, Walt Disney World Word of the Week. Thank you so much again, as always, for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a little something I did while researching this episode. There were a couple of those little nuggets that I threw out there that I had never heard before. So hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. And if you did... All I ask is that you share it with someone, tell someone about it. You know you have a Frontierland fan in your family or a Western fan, somebody who loves, you know, John Wayne or Clint Eastwood or those old Western movies or shows like Bonanza, which I've never seen, but someone in your family has. So if you <laughs> did enjoy the show, please tell them about it. I'd really appreciate it. And remember, there will be a new episode of the Word of the Week each and every Wednesday morning as well as a new episode of the regular Ear to Their podcast each and every Monday morning. So until next time, thank you again so, so much for listening. Have a Frontierland phenomenal week. That was a stretch. Bye-bye.